Welcome back to this GNN series. As you might remember, the long-term goal for this project was to generate potential HIV inhibitors using a generative graph model. Today I quickly want to talk about a couple of things that need to be considered when building such a model for molecules. So what we want to do is simply generate new graphs. In the deep learning field there are currently two popular approaches when it comes to generative modeling. These are generative adversarial networks and variational autoencoders. Of course, as always, there exist many variants of these models and these two papers are just some examples around this topic. I decided to go with variational autoencoders in this series and there is no specific reason for that, it's just that I feel more comfortable with VAEs. A couple of years ago I also played around with GANs but it was kind of difficult to train them. When it comes to generating molecules, there are also many papers that use SMILES codes to represent the structure of molecules. This however is rather a NLP task because you try to generate the SMILES grammar of new molecules. This paper for instance uses a transformer model in combination with a variational autoencoder to generate new molecules with target properties. But as this is a graph series, we will of course use graph models. So let's first quickly talk about the basics of variational autoencoders. There are many good videos on this topic on YouTube, which I will link in the video description. Generally, the architecture consists of an encoder and a decoder, which are both some sort of neural network. In the middle of an encoder, we have a bottleneck in form of a vector. And that means nothing else but a list of numbers. This vector is usually called latent vector or latent codes and is simply the output of the encoder network. This bottleneck forces the model to compress the input representation into this vector so that it is able to recover the input again from this compressed representation. So the model learns how to compress information into something from which it is able to recover from. So far that's only an autoencoder because the latent representation is a deterministic single vector like a point estimate. Variational autoencoders however add some variation to this vector. And this is achieved by saying each of the values in this vector should follow a distribution instead of being a single number. Why would someone want to do that? So what's wrong with a single value? Well, what this allows us to do is to sample from this distribution to generate new data. So the latent representation is now a space and not a single point anymore. And also in plain autoencoders, the latent vector is not organized, which means we have no control over how the model compresses the information. This is a problem because if we want to decode random data points, we cannot ensure that these points really make sense or will be decoded into something useful. Therefore, in the classical variational autoencoder, each of the values follows a normal distribution with a specific mean mu and a variance sigma. I will explain in a second what exactly that epsilon term does there, but generally it's the mu, so the, the mean of the distribution, plus the variance, so sigma. So far, this latent vector was the output of the encoder, but as we have a distribution, how do we get the mu and sigma for our distribution? It's as simple as just outputting them by the encoder. With this mean and sigma, we build normal distributions and then simply sample from them. This gives us a single vector just like before, but now it comes from each of these distributions. If the latent representation would only consist of two values, so the latent space would have a dimension of two, the distributions could look like this, for instance. Let's have a look at a simple example. Let's say this image is our input. We compress it with any kind of neural network, for instance a CNN, and output these eight means and eight variances. Then we sample from them, get a real vector and pass that into the neural network which decodes, so reconstructs the image as shown here. And that's pretty much how VAEs work. Now there's one more thing we need to talk about, the loss functions. Essentially we want to achieve two things for this architecture. First of all we want to reconstruct the input data 
And secondly, we want to enforce the latent representation to be close to a standard normal distribution. That's why the loss for this architecture consists of two parts, a reconstruction loss and a regularization term for the latent vector. The reconstruction loss is pretty simple, we just want the model to reconstruct the input as close as possible. There are different choices for this term, such as the cross entropy loss or the mean squared error. The regularization term is the kullback leibler divergence and ensures that the latent space is close to a normal distribution. Without this loss term, nothing enforces the model to organize the latent space in a proper way. It could output very small variances, for instance, or means that are far away from each other. This, however, would again prohibit us from sampling new data points, because similar inputs might be decoded very differently. The KL divergence gives us control over the latent space. It simply says, make the latent code similar to a standard normal distribution with mean equal to zero and standard deviation equal to one. It's also possible to visualize this for two dimensions. I found this nice plot on the internet. As you can see, using both loss terms, we get a proper orientation in the latent space. Mathematically, the loss of a variational autoencoder looks like this. The first term is the negative reconstruction likelihood, which is essentially the cross entropy. So Q is the encoder and that theta in the index represents the weights and biases of the network. P is the decoder and in the index we have a phi which represents the decoder's weights and biases. If we minimize the negative log likelihood, it's like maximizing the reconstruction likelihoods. The second term is the KL divergence between the distribution of the latent representation and the prior, which is a unit Gaussian distribution. Minimizing the whole term is equal to maximizing the evidence lower bound, or in short elbow, which is the typical loss function for VAEs from a probabilistic perspective. When backpropagating this loss function, we need to pay attention because we sample from the latent representation. Gradients can, however, not flow through a random node, so this sampling node. A simple workaround is done using this epsilon. And this is called a reparameterization trick. Using this epsilon, we can create a new node which has a normal distribution and can be used for sampling and we combine it with the mu and sigma from the encoder. So we multiply this epsilon with sigma and this way we can easily sample outside of the network and we can still backpropagate mu and sigma and have no problems when backpropagating the gradients without passing through a random node. So these were the basics of variational autoencoders. We want to have a look at graph variational autoencoders which are a little bit different because there are a couple of tricky parts we have to think about. While variational autoencoders are pretty straightforward for image data, our molecule graphs are more difficult to reconstruct. First of all, we need to reconstruct the adjacency matrix. For molecules, this even means we need to reconstruct the bond types, so the different edge types of the graph. In the latent representation, we can use the node embeddings as well as the atom types to recover the adjacency information. Of course, when later using the decoder to generate new molecules, we don't want to specify the atom types manually. Instead, the models should sample them automatically. So that means if we want to generate a new molecule, we don't want to say this molecule has three H atoms and two C atoms or whatever we want the model to do something by itself. Therefore, the second part we need to reconstruct are the atom types of each node in the molecule. Finally, for this latent representation, we still need to specify how many atoms we have in the output molecule. As you see, we have in the latent vector five node embeddings. Ideally, we would even want to sample that. Therefore, the latent representation now would only be one vector from which we can recover everything. The adjacency matrix, the edge types, the atom types, and the number of atoms. So, as you can see, many things we need to consider when reconstructing molecule graphs. 
these three sections here are increasing levels of complexity. Most of the tutorials about graph variational autoencoders only talk about the first option, which is recovering the adjacency matrix. For simplicity, we will begin the PyTorch implementation with that and later increase the levels of complexity until it is possible to sample entirely new molecules from one latent vector. Finally, I quickly want to show an example for an encoder and a decoder in a graph VAE. The encoder is pretty simple. It's actually quite similar to the graph neural network I used in the last videos for this binary classification task. So we can, for instance, have a couple of GNN layers that perform message passing on the node embeddings. The output embeddings are then simply passed through a fully connected neural network to predict mu and sigma for the latent distributions. Optionally, we can also apply pooling on the embeddings and aggregate them into a graph level representation. And that's pretty much how a simple encoder could look like. It gets more difficult for the decoder as we need to reconstruct a lot of things such as the bond types, the atom types and the number of atoms. As already mentioned, for simplicity we will at first only reconstruct the adjacency matrix. For this there exists a pretty simple architecture, the inner product decoder. The input for the decoder are the mu's and sigmas for the latent representation. We have these mu's and sigmas for each of the nodes in our graph, so if we have a graph with five nodes, then we would sample five vectors which come from different mu's and sigmas. All we do now is just calculate the inner product of these vectors, so we sample from each of the distributions and then calculate the inner product with each other. This gives us a matrix where each value gives a probability for the edge between two nodes, for example like this. On these logic values we can then apply the cross entropy loss and simply compare this output adjacency matrix with the true adjacency matrix and later we can simply reconstruct the adjacency matrix by saying every probability over 0.5 will be a 1, so a connection, and everything else will be no connection. We don't have the edge types yet and we also don't have the atom types or the number of atoms but this is a start because we can recover the graph structure from a latent vector. And that's exactly what I try to implement in the next weeks. So the next video will include all of the code for these illustrations. And of course I will also upload this to GitHub. With that I wish you a nice day and see you in the next video.